In this episode of the Church Security Roll Call, we're going to be discussing lessons learned from another church shooting. Stay tuned. Hi, this is Chris with Sheepdog Church Security, and this is your Church Security Roll Call. Today we're going to be discussing the 2017 Sutherland Springs Church Shooting. If you'd like to read that article, go to our website, sheepdogchurchsecurity.net, and look under the News tab. So let's begin in the Bible. If you're watching the video, you'll notice we're not going to be posting it by me. Um, it's just because this is really long. This is uh, 1 Samuel chapter 22, verse 18, and then we're going to drop down to 20, verse 22. And uh, the reason we're bringing this verse up um, is because this is King Saul having a real problem with his son-in-law, and he believes that the priests are assisting him. And so um, he, takes, he takes action in a bad way. The king of Doeg um, turn thou and fall upon the priests. And Doeg the Emilite turned, and he fell upon the priests, and slew um, that day fourscore and five persons that did wear the linen ephrod. And, no and Nob, the city of priests, smote he with the edge of the sword, both men and women, children and sucklings and oxen and asses and sheep, with the edge of the sword. And David said to Abathar, I knew that day when Doeg the Ammonite was there that he would surely tell Saul, I, I have occasion, occasioned the death of all persons in thy, in thy father's house. And so that's exactly what's happening in this shooting. It starts with this domestic violence situation. And it, it's unresolved and stays unresolved. And then, of course, it results in violence. And in the case of Sutherland Springs, a great deal of violence. Before we continue, I want to remind you to click on the weekly notes. It's going to take you over to another page. All you need to do is put in your email address and hit submit, and then we send you the notes. And the idea behind having those notes is this is share this video with your team. Share this video with other people in your congregation. Maybe it's volunteers, maybe it's staff, maybe it's the pastor, you know, whatever it is. And then with those notes, you can kind of talk about these lessons learned from this shooting, and this mass murder, quite frankly, and what things can you do and your church can do to try to prevent these things from happening. So let's get into this. Um, it was the first Sunday of November uh, seven, uh, 2017. The pastor of the First Baptist Church in Sutherland Springs, Texas, and his wife were in Oklahoma. Their 14-year-old daughter was left home so she wouldn't miss school. The speaker that morning was a visiting preacher who brought his family, five children, and his pregnant wife. This Sunday, some of the congregation were elsewhere, unknown to them at the time, it was just as well for them not to be there. About 11 o'clock, a black pickup truck parked nearby. 20 minutes later, the driver emerged wearing a, um, black clothing, body armor, and a black ski mask with a white skull and uh, pulled out a rifle. He shot and killed two persons outside, then began firing at the building, knocking out windows. He entered through the back door. Inside the sanctuary, when bullets came through the windows, attenders um, began to take cover, mostly under pews. For most of them, this would be scant concealment and poor cover. The assailant would use his military training to search and destroy his targets. He announced his intent with, everybody dies. He walked up and down the aisle looking for targets. In all the noise, babies began crying. According to survivors, the shooter followed their cries. A couple who survived played dead. The service was be, um, being recorded and a video showed how methodical the killer was. More, more could have been shot, but, a, um, but the shooter, the killer, heard a shout from outside the front door, which was now open. He went outside to confront whoever it was. Uh, Stephen Wilford, 
A lot of you guys have heard his name before. Lived next door. His daughter alerted him to the sounds of gunfire at the church. An INRA instructor, he grabbed his rifle and headed outside. In exchange of fire, he wounded the assailant who came out to confront him. The killer ran to his truck, got in, and sped away. Williford ran to a pickup at a stop sign, told the driver that the driver of the black truck had just shot up the church. Um, he got in, and they took off in pursuit. Uh, racing northwest on the highway at 95 miles per hour, um, they stayed on the tail of the shooter while Wilford called 911, keeping authorities updated on the shooter's location. On a curve, the attacker missed the turn, hit a sign, and careened into a ditch. The pursuers kept the black truck covered until law enforcement arrived. Arriving officers found the driver slumped over dead. The medical examiner found three bullet wounds, one in the leg, one in the torso, and one in the head. According to the examiner, the headshot was evidently a self-inflicted hand, um, self-inflicted with a handgun. More weapons and ammunition were found in the truck. So, 26 persons were killed at the uh, First Baptist Church in Sutherland Springs, and 20 more were injured. So far, this is the most killed in a church shooting in the United States. And then, of course, the dead included the visiting preacher and his family, um, eight if you count the unborn child, and of course, we probably do, and then the pastor's daughter and the killer's grandma, uh, grandmother-in-law. All right, so let's learn a little bit about this killer. Um, the assailant uh, did not grow up in Sutherland Springs, but close in San Antonio. He was suspended many times in high school. Infractions included insubordination, drugs, profanity, falsification of records. Other um, students described him as strange, weird, and an outcast, but popular with other outcasts. One former um, classmate called him the first atheist I met. However, another one who had known him longer said that in middle school he was involved in the church and a believer of God. It appears that somewhere he had turned against God and going downhill from there. Um, after high school, 2010, the killer enlisted in the Air Force and was stationed in New Mexico. Um, this was also a Rocky. Um, some of the personnel who worked with him said that he was in and out of trouble. His um, record included uh, threatening superiors, smuggling arms onto the base, threatening to kill himself, etc. For a while, he was committed to a mental hospital, but he escaped, and then they caught him and returned him to that mental hospital. The last infraction was a criminal one, resulting in a court-martial. Um, he married in 2011. His wife had a son from a previous relationship, and in 2012, he assaulted her and also her son, cracking his skull. A court-martial convicted him of domestic abuse with serious injury and sentenced him to 12 months in confinement, followed by a dishonorable discharge. Um, this conviction should have barred him from ever buying a firearm. However, the Air Force failed to submit um, his arrest and conviction to the National Database for Firearm Background Checks. And so he was able to lie on his application, and there was no, there was no check on that. Um, that first wife divorced him while he was in jail. Out of this service, the su suspect, the killer, moved back to his hometown. Uh, we don't know the state of his mind was at that time, but you can imagine it wasn't good. Um, sometime after returning, he married a young woman who grew up with him in Southern Springs and a member of the First Baptist Church. He attended the church there with her and her family, but we don't know how often he went there or what kind of actual impact it had on him. Um, but the members of the church did know him. Uh, whatever their first impression was, they became uneasy with his presence as time went on. A hostile relationship developed between him and his in-laws. He began sending threatening messages to his mother-in-law. The last one was received the morning of the attack. She was not at church that day, but her mother was. The suspect had been able to buy several firearms. As a high school student, he, um, he again falsified questions, answering no for disqualifying um, convictions. And since there was no record of his conviction in the national database, he got all, all he wanted and all he felt like he needed. 
He did set up a firing range prior to this in a farm field. Neighbors complained of the noise of the shooting. He told someone that he wanted to adopt dogs from a shelter so he could use them as target practice. The last week of October, the First Baptist Church had a fall festival where he showed up wearing all black and acting strangely. His demeanor made him, uh, several people uneasy. And so then you have the shooting. So lessons learned here. I'm going to kind of, let's, let's start in the beginning as we often do. Uh, well, let me start with a disclaimer first. We, we never want to be misunderstood as victim blaming. I know you guys know this. You've been probably following me for a while. You've listened to a lot of these. We're not victim blaming here. My belief is the best way we can honor these victims is to learn from their mistakes, to learn from what went right and what went wrong so that we can apply these to other houses of worship and this kind of thing doesn't happen again, okay? So hindsight is 2020. I get that. But that's the whole point, right? We need to examine when things go wrong and then, and then take action so they don't go wrong again. So the first thing I want to bring up is this. They clearly had no plan. The church had no plan at all for this type of event. And I think that's true for a lot of our churches. We simply don't have any plan. We don't want to think about this. I was just um, talking with a guy on Facebook not too long ago, um, this morning actually. And he was just saying that, you know, he, he commented that run, hide, fight just gets people killed. And I asked him to explain himself. And basically, his church has decided that no firearms can be used at all. They can't carry them. They basically made, you know, made a new policy, a new rule, no firearms in the church. And then so then I asked them, I said, you know, well, okay, so they've eliminated your ability to fight or your effectiveness of the fight, of the run-hide fight. Um, do they allow you to have less lethal weapons of any sort? Not that you would run into a fight with a less lethal weapon, um, you know, you don't, you know, it's like bringing a knife to a gunfight. Um, but it certainly could be, depending on what's happening, it could be better than throwing books at them, you know, at the bad guy, for an example. And he says, no, we're not even allowed to do that. And so I think there's a lot of churches that they think about these kind of situations and then decide to almost do nothing, right? There's just, they're not going to do anything. You know, he told me that, you know, I asked him, what about drills? You know, can you do lockdowns? And he's like, well, none of the classrooms are lockable and all this. It's, and they don't want to do any sort of drills. So they basically, they recognize the threat and decide to do nothing and actually remove the ability of their safety team or their congregation to take any sort of action. So that's one response. Another response is, it's a complete denial. They don't think about it. They don't want to think about it. Um, it would never happen to us, and they just drive on with their lives, and they do nothing. And then that's how stuff like this happens. They have no plan. And, it, and there was a problem with that. Now, one of the things that we talked about this a lot recently is, according to statistics, 75% of all active shooter situations start outside the church. So here's the deal, and that's exactly what happened here. This guy shot two people in the parking lot and continued to shoot at the church. Now, if they would have had even a simple lockout procedure, right? Some, even if you're going to go, we're, we'll talk about safety posture here in about two seconds, but even if you had a plan to go run and lock those doors, they would have kept him outside and you wouldn't have had that situation where he's just able to walk up and down the aisle just shooting who he wants. Now, you know, we talked about guns, the importance of gun, you know, the good guys with a gun. We're also going to talk about that. And that's certainly a way to stop him. But isn't it so much better if he would have been held up at that back door that he entered, kicking it, shooting it, doing whatever, and just having to stay outside? Now you have Wilford, who's a clear hero. Now when his daughter reports shots fired at the church, when he comes out of his house, the bad guy is at the back door still trying to get in. You see how this could have all completely changed with something as simple as a good lockout plan? Now what's better than that even is a safety posture. 
meaning that exterior doors are always locked. Now, at the beginning of services, you have a greeter or a safety team member standing at the front door. Everyone knows they need to come into the front door. And you simply just shake hands and hold the door open as people come in. And then once, if there is something happens, you just get out of the way of the door and the door pulls shut or pull the door shut if it doesn't have one of those little springy things that pulls door shut. You know, and then you're in a lockout situation. Now you can choose what you're going to do. Are you going to huddle in the safe place, get down low, let the guy keep shooting until the police arrive or Williford jumps out and shoots him? You know, what's, you know, what's the plan there? Um, we need to go beyond that. But you get my point here. Three out of four active shooters at churches start outside. So if we at least plan for that, a lockout procedure, safety posture, we're going to save lives three out of four times, right? The next thing is a good guy with a gun. Um, I'm going to talk about two sides of this. Number one, anyone that follows me, you guys have been listening, I believe in a good guy with a gun. If there would have been even just one or two people in that service that were armed and prepared to engage a bad guy coming in through the back door or breaking his way through the back door because we had a good safety posture, you know, you got two guys firing at two from two different um, covered positions, throwing rounds down range while he has to come through that narrow door. He's neutralized before it even gets started. Once again, shooting at the church, trying to break in the back door because we have a good safety posture. Now coming through that fatal funnel with two firearms engaging him into that spot where his ability to move left and right is fully, is totally restricted. A good guy with a gun. Now I get that there are churches out there that will never allow you to have firearms in the church. I get that. But that's where all the other stuff kind of comes in, right? Run, hide, fight. In this situation, you're not really prepared to fight. So what's your run plan? What's your evacuation plan? What's your lockdown plan? So you can at least, if people are pinned down, they're pinned down in rooms and offices and other places that at least they, at least they're, once again, it's like that back door being locked, right? We're slowing him down for someone like Williford or law enforcement to show up. Even if you are armed, you have armed people, all of this lockdown, lockout stuff makes complete sense for you. Because, you know, I, I, want, I don't know if you've had this conversation with your spouse or your family, but we talk about being out in the open. You know, like we're at Walmart, you know, we're at the grocery store, whatever, and the shooting starts. One of the instructions I've given my wife and I've given my daughter is, in order for me to focus on what I need to do, I need to know that you're safe. So you need to go run, hide, and fight. You know, you need to, I don't expect them to be standing next to me throwing rounds down range, though my wife's prepared to do that. I would rather her just grab my daughter and go out, you know, lock down into a classroom or, you know, make it out a side door and, you know, over the river and through the woods. She can call me from the next state over. And then I know she's safe. I just want them to be safe so I can focus on what I'm doing. So even though you have armed people, Please don't disregard the importance of having good lockdown procedures and or evacuation procedures to get people out. Now, in the case of this case here, if they would have just simply evacuated, not the best case scenario, but he's breaking in through the back door or he comes through the back door, they could have all run out the front door. Now, there still would have been a body count, but it would have been, I believe, it would have been a lower body count with people running, getting outside, and like I said, keep running until you, until you can't even see the church anymore. Those would have been safe people instead of waiting their turn to die in the aisles of the church. So, 75% start outside. Lockout procedures going to stop 75% of these active shooters. A good um, safety posture so you're always in that lockout so you don't have to worry about somebody running to go lock the door. It already is locked. A good guy with a gun. And the last thing is this is a threat assessment team. Now we're going to call it something else in the church. You can call it anything you want. But basically the point of this threat assessment team is this. There were only about a million warning signs with this guy. 
right down to the family getting threatening text messages, family that knew his history. And one of the things I'm not privy to is what kind of conversations occurred before this event about him. There really should have been conversations about him. And once you become aware of a potential threat, then you start making very specific plan because, hey, we know that this guy is off his rocker and he's been making threat, you know, threatening text messages and he might just show up to church. So now the safety team, the leadership is at an elevated level of, of threat. And so, you, you, you know, maybe you have two kinds of plans. You know, I've told you one time that uh, a battle I won and lost about a dozen times at my church was that safety posture. And what it really came down to in the end was this, is if we were at an elevated threat because of, you know, a threatening text came in or an email or a letter or whatever, then we went into that safety posture. And so that's maybe what you're kind of doing. If you can't convince your church to have those doors locked, then you're going to have to monitor them as a team. And you're going to have to be aware. You have to be out in the parking lot patrolling, all that kind of good stuff. But then if there's an identifiable threat, like, hey, did you see this guy who's commenting on our Facebook page? Turns out he lives within driving distance of us. Maybe we need to be in a safety posture until this passes. You know, that kind of deal. But the whole point of that threat assessment team is to have conversations. Now, I would say biblically, it's good to have a, a team of people that are intentional about ministering to people that are hurting. Right? Somebody loses their job. This group of you know ministry leaders or whatever should be helping that person through the, that difficult time. If somebody's going through a divorce or a custody battle, somebody should be reaching out to them. And, and I would say even going further than what the church typically go, does, if they stop coming to church, we continue to contact them on a somewhat regular basis. They kind of stay on our list until they either tell us to go away, which could happen, or they're just going to say, I'm going to a new church, or hey, I got a new job, or you know, the divorce is done, and my spouse now lives you know, a state over, whatever. You know, We're monitoring these situations. And part of it is just to be really good Christians, right? To really, really care for people, take care of people, and, and, and be the hands and feet of Christ. I mean, that's a great idea. But at the other end of that, we're also mitigating the risk of these kind of events happening at our church. And this is something that the safety director should be part of. So they know that, hey, there are some people at risk here, and we need to be alert as a team. And even if we're talking about pastoral confidentiality, I totally get that. And maybe that safety director isn't allowed to be part of that team because they're talking about people that are really struggling and they don't have the permission to tell him or her, the director. The pastor should still, somebody should still be able to go to that director and say, hey, someone's going through a custody battle right now. It's getting really ugly. And I can't tell you who but I could just tell you that this is happening at the church right now. Well, what do you do as the safety director then? Okay, I got. Th I can work with that, right? We don't know who. I, you know, I would prefer to know who, but I don't need to know that. I can get my team together and say, hey, we're at an elevated risk because of this custody issue that's going on right now. And now my team's more vigilant. Now, we would all want all of us to always be vigilant at all times. I get that. That's the gold standard, but human... The truth of human nature is this, is Sunday after Sunday, week after week, month after month, after a while we just kind of get comfortable, I guess is, the, is a word to use. We get comfortable with things. So if we're told by the leadership, hey, there's a special threat going on right now that you should be aware of, what does that do? It kind of brings us back to where we should be paying attention. So basically this, you got to have a plan. I think there's a great deal of wisdom in having trained, armed people ready to respond. And then third, we need to be very deliberate for our point of view. It's intelligence gathering. For the church's point of view, it's serving people in the congregation. And I think, like I said, that's a very good thing. Other than that, before I let you go, um, 
We have launched our Alumni Association. Basically, if you've ever graduated from our academy and you got your certification card, you can become part of our Alumni Association. And what that's all about is putting you in contact with other people like you that's gone through the training, working in uh, church safety, and um, you can collaborate with each other. You know, so maybe there a new law comes out, a new restriction or some other requirement that your team has to have, you can talk to each other. Um, also, too, policies and procedures. Well, policies are often legal documents that need attorneys. Well, it sure is nice to be able to borrow a set from somebody who's already gone through that process, maybe, and then have that as a starting point. Now, you need your attorney to review it, um, but you get what I'm saying is there's a lot of help in that alumni association. We have the potential for hundreds of people being there, but it is something that you um, you can cho choose to be part of once you're certified with us. And so I can't, this is a new program, so I can't tell you that hundreds of people will be in it. I can just tell you that I'm sure there will be people. So anyway, so you definitely want to check that out, especially if you're already certified. If not, if you're looking at getting certified, just realize that's something that's waiting for you at the end. Once you get certified, then you can start networking even better with people in your state. Other than that, thank you so much for joining me today, and hey, let's be careful out there. This program is made for informational purposes only and should not be taken as legal advice.